I am Janet Buskirk and I have been a potter for about 25 years and today I am going to demonstrate making a fossil plate and I make a lot of dinnerware. I've made a lot of functional pots and a lot of uh, sculptural work over the years. These days I make almost 100% functional pottery. I'm really well known for purple plates and other types of dinnerware. I make a lot of mugs, I make a lot of bowls, I make a lot of plates. And um, I've been making this work for probably 20 years. And um, I sell my work in Portland through our studio. And I also sell it in a variety of galleries at the coast. You can also find more information about me or my work at my website. I am going to make a fossil dinner plate today. And these plates I make using a slab, a clay slab. And then I press an impression of a fossil into the clay. And then I bisque fire it. And after the bisque firing, I glaze it and I put some broken glass into the fossil impression and um, and it makes it this nice glossy cool color. So I'll start by wedging some clay and making my slab. For those of you who have done ceramics before, you know that we spend a lot of time just prepping our clay. For those of you who have not done ceramics, we spend a lot of time doing things like wedging and um, reconstituting clay. Typically when I'm making these plates, I wedge up a lot of clay and I make a lot of plates at once. I'm just making one today, so I'm wedging a very small piece of clay. So I'm heading over to my slab roller. There are lots of ways to make a slab. And I do a combination of rolling a slab on the slab roller and throwing the slab on my tabletop. Throwing it is not using a potter's wheel type throwing. It's um, a technique of stretching the clay out. So here is the slab that I've rolled. Now we come back over to the table. Oops, it has a couple of air bubbles in it. Get rid of those. And now I'm going to throw the slab on the table. And if this is stretching the clay out, and I find that the thrown slabs are a little bit more elastic and a nicer consistency of clay than a slab that has just been rolled on the slab roller and has not been thrown. So I always like to do a little bit of both. I use a squeegee just from my local hardware store to smooth the clay. And getting rid of some little blemishes in the clay. Okay, and I turn it over, do the same thing on the other side. This finished piece has quite a bit of texture on the piece. So what I've used, I've done a roller, a wooden roller that rolls texture around the rim. This one was a dragonfly texture. And I'll use the same one for the piece that I'm about to make. And then I also pressed some impressions of scallop shells, some impression of ammonite fossils, and these are impressions of fish skeletons. So I'll do something very similar with the one that I'm about to make. 
So first, I take my Dragonfly roller, and this I bought from MKM Tools. They, um, they advertise in Ceramics Monthly Magazine. They make a wide variety of rollers. I've also made my own rollers fairly often, just out of a piece of clay, which um, I carve into, and then I bisque fire it, and it makes a fantastic roller. But it sure is easy to buy them from MKM Tools. So I've just done a little roll. This will be the outside of the plate. Now I've made these bisqued clay stamps. And um, these are all impressions from actual shells or fossils or fish skeletons. And I like using the bisqued clay version rather than the original because it doesn't stick to the clay. Um, if you used an actual ammonite, it's so hard and non-porous that when you press it into the clay, it doesn't want to come out. It just wants to stick. So I've made these from molds of actual shells and fossils. So first, this ammonite has a little indentation, so I need to add little pieces of clay to the places where I'll put the ammonite. And these little pieces of clay, the indentation will push into them. Now, I press my ammonite into that. And I'll do the other two. And now I'll take my fish skeleton. And press that in. And then take my little scallop shell. and press that in. Okay, now, how do I make this into a plate shape? Many years ago, I made a whole lot of these plate molds. And this is just made out of the clay that I use every day. I threw this on the wheel and um, I bisque fired these molds to a somewhat low temperature. For those of you who are potters, um, I bisque these to 06, where I normally bisque to 04. This may not mean much to the general public, but potters know what I mean. Um, so I made these molds and I set this slab of clay inside this mold and then I let it sit for a few hours to stiffen up. And um, Clay shrinks quite a bit. Okay, there's my slab sitting in my mold. I'll cut it out. Clay shrinks quite a bit, and so I'm making a 10 inch dinner plate. The original mold that I threw was probably about a 13 inch mold, and it shrank as it dried. This plate is still considerably bigger than the finished product. It will shrink a little bit as it dries, and um, it'll also shrink in the glaze firing. So right now I take a sponge and I wipe around the edge. And then I take my handy needle tool and I just cut a little tiny bit around the edge. If I don't do this, the clay sticks just in one or two little spots to the mold and my plate doesn't dry quite flat. 
So I just loosened the edge from the mold and now I'm going to sort of tap it on the tabletop. And that is finished step one. So now I am at step two of making these plates. This is a plate that I made early this morning and it has been sitting in its bisque clay mold since um, about eight hours ago. And at this point, the clay has set up quite a bit. It's dried. It's um, here in the US, we call this stage leather hard. In England, they call it cheese hard. And I think that's a really great description. It is about the consistency of a piece of hard cheese. So right now, I'm going to flip this plate over. I'll set it on my table, flip it over, and I'm cleaning up the edges. Right now it has a very, very sharp edge. So I take this um, basic chopstick and just scoot it around the edge. And then I take this trimming tool and just take a little bit of clay off of the edge. I'm just easing the edges, softening them so that they're not so sharp. I also sign the pot with the trimming tool while I'm doing this. And now just take a little bit more clay off of the edge. And now this, I will set upside down on a flat surface and let it dry the rest of the way. And I leave it upside down because it keeps it much straighter and flatter. We are now ready to start working with the bisque clay piece and getting ready to glaze it. So back in the, my original piece here, I have glass that I've put inside the fossils. The rest of it has glaze on it. And it's a little tricky to put glaze on a piece if you don't want the glaze to go in certain places. So I don't want glaze where the fossils are. I've discovered that if I put the melted glass on top of the glaze, it's kind of an ugly color. So I use a wax that resists the glaze. And wherever I put the wax, the glaze will not stick to the pot. So I have wax in my little jar. I put some food coloring in my wax so that I know where it is on the pot. If you don't put food coloring in it, it's clear and it's hard to see where you've put it. So now my wax is blue. The food coloring and the wax both burn out in the kiln. So I'm going to put my wax on my little ammonite. And I'll put some on the scallop. And I'm going to do this one as well. Okay, and that is the waxing step. So now I am going to glaze. And I have two small pieces that I'm going to put some glaze on. I mix all of my own glazes. And this one is the same glaze that is on this piece. All of the blue areas, all of the areas that are not the seashells and the fish skeletons are this glaze. With ceramics, the glazes often don't look anything like the finished product. So this is my glaze right now. It's just a tan liquid. And I'm going to pour it onto these pieces. And 
And as you see, the ammonite is not getting any glaze on it because of the wax resist. And there are various ways that you can apply glaze with ceramics. I, I do what they call dipping and pouring. So that was obviously pouring. For the second coat of glaze, I'm just going to dip this in the bucket. Which also puts a little bit of glaze on the exterior of the piece. And I'll let that sit for a minute and then I'll dip the other end. I put two coats of this glaze on these plates. Dip the other end. And I'll wipe the glaze off of the bottom. I make sure to not have any glaze on the bottom of the piece because it will, when the glaze melts in the kiln, the piece will stick to my kiln shelf and it will never ever come off. So I have to make sure and clean all of the glaze off of the bottoms of these right now. Okay, so these are glazed. Now my final step for these is to put the glass that I'll melt into the ammonites. And um, I've experimented with numerous different types of glass. And what I found works really, really well is broken car window glass. So I don't break my neighbor's car windows out. We collect broken glass around the neighborhood and um, it's pretty easy to find, unfortunately. And I wash it off and then I use it for these pieces. So I have my little handy spoon and I just sort of spoon little piles of glass into these. One of the nice things about the car window glass is that it's not terribly sharp. So I can move these around with my fingers without cutting myself. And it's pretty interesting how much color is in this window glass. You know, our car windows are tinted and um, the blue in the glass comes out sometimes in the kiln. Sometimes these pieces come out really quite blue, which I really like. And that is enough glass in that one. The glass melts very quickly and spreads out quite a bit. I will put that in the kiln and fire it. And that's a finished piece. So thank you for watching my video. I hope this inspired you in your love of pottery or to make new things. And I hope that we'll see you at Ceramic Showcase at some point in the future. Thanks.